uh, are we okay, uh, Ms. Piri, with the uh, sequence that we have set? Only one exception I'm making now, thanks to uh, thanks to Mr. Sinha's being present. Yeah. I, before uh, our uh, uh, Suresh Hedlikar speaks, I'll probably ask him to speak for some one or two minutes, if it is all right with him. I, I, he has come actually to listen. <laughs> you know, he'll be embarrassed if I ask him to talk now. But uh, no, I mean, then in that case, yeah. Hello, Haji. Please tell me. No, wait, I can't hear you. You have you become mute. You have to unmute. Okay. You have to unmute. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Hello, correct. I want to say yes. okay. okay. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Harisa, what I'm saying, uh, why don't uh, you know Shinwa speak after uh, Mr. Hablika? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also fine. Yeah. He's already raised his hand. I don't know why he has raised his hand. You can yeah. speak, uh, Mr. Shinwa. You can speak. If you don't want to, you have to unmute yourself and speak. Unless you want to speak to me only. Call me then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Me if you like, unless you can, you can, uh, you can unmute and speak. You can kill anything, okay. Siddhish, if you don't mind, please. Yes, no, yes, yes. yes, I think you yes. have to. YouTube, YouTube live is now open, sir. No, uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful. Okay. Uh, okay, just one minute. One minute. You have to unmute. I mean, uh, it will show. Stop video. Other you will start video. Just uh, then I will ask him to unmute for you. Yeah, yeah. Host. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. I'll, he will sort it out. Ah, there, there. Correct. Oh, okay. I agree. I agree. Right, right, right. Um, 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 uh, Sudesh, one more thing is, that, you know, for all the people, yes, you have to you have to open the video. I think you have blocked the video for people. In fact, even Mr. Shinya is going to say that, and uh, he agrees that he will speak after the address, the the uh, the uh, uh, address from Mr. He will speak after. Okay. this you have to be online yes sir yes sir now you Hello? tell us when to go ahead it's 306 already yeah yeah i think you should go ahead sir. you should go ahead think, yes sir yes sir uh, mr berry are you okay are we going ahead yeah because it's already 36 i think wonderful I think we absolutely you must get yeah. started yeah by uh, the way kyle is here uh hari Oh, uh, she has not joined in yet. Tapasya, will you? She has not joined yet. Uh, no, she has not joined. I, she will join. Tapasya, will you call her? Yeah, sure. So, Tapasya, you can call her. You have the number, I think. You can call her. Yeah, please. Uh, not wait for her. I think you should get started. Uh, Ms. Mary, you are starting it or should I? I will start it. That's what we decide to discuss, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good afternoon, friends. Greetings from IGBC Bangalore chapter and welcome to Harit Prem Bharat Mahotsav 2021. My relationship with Dr. Prem C. Jain began in 2006. Honestly, I am yet to come across a person of his grace and persona. If I am here amidst this august audience, the entire credit should go to Dr. Pinsey Jain, for he literally handled me and passed on a legacy which was so close to his heart. May Almighty God grant him eternal peace. Dr. Pinsey Jain expired on 28th of September 2018, and uh, the Pinsey Pain Jain Memorial Trust which is headed by his beloved daughter, uh, Payal Jain. Uh, you know, see, they, they are celebrating every year, you know, one week as a Prem Bharat Mahotsav. And this year that is happening from 23rd of, uh, uh, you know, Jan till 29th of Jan. 
in this regard i give you a bandu chapter came up with the two events you know and uh, according to me both are better you know as a bandu chapter is always known for i must tell you bandu chapter is a um, you know trend setter in many ways the first um, uh, student chapter you know the first green walkathon how green is my school and the uh, waves and many others you know we started it and the uh, other chapters um, you know uh, uh, followed uh, in this series again you know uh, the the series what we're talking about the first event is uh, dr prem jain distinguished memorial lecture in memory of the uh, you know dr prem c jain the series of lecture will then be continued by other chapters like chandigarh hyderabad coimbatore and uh, you know eventually it's like a pan india event it is also our good fortune that uh, we have such a distinguished personality like uh, mr suresh hablikar the renowned filmmaker actor director a well known environmentalist and more than that a great human being and the second event is a short documentary film contest you know named as prem jain film mahotsav you know thanks to tapasya architect tapasya she coined the word and she has contributed a great deal thank you tapasya for your uh, you know active participation and uh, this is open for all and uh, i call upon every one of you uh, to partake this in this in this uh, you know uh, competition and also spread the news to your friends and relatives best pre film will be screened uh, coming uh, friday that is 29th of jan and there will be cash prizes and um, you know uh, and uh, uh, you know that is going to create a great deal of uh, you know great deal of uh, uh, what is that uh, uh, the the you know the great deal of uh, exposure to the uh, indian green building uh, you know moment and once again i uh, thank every one of you for participating in this uh, you know uh, distinguished lecture series uh, in memory of dr pinchy jain and uh, uh, i i invite uh, you know uh, mr suresh hablikar uh, to give you a uh, give you a uh, you know uh, lecture but before that uh, i would also like to thank, uh, welcome mr srinivas uh, the the member secretary of uh, karnataka state pollution control board it is so nice of you sir in uh, taking your time and uh, participating in this uh, event on the request of uh, dr hari aran and uh, before dr uh, you know, before suresh hablikar starts his lecture i i call upon i think pail is going to talk for a for a minute or two with her good wishes and then um, you know dr P, uh, Pro, dr hariran will uh, take over and then we will have a, a, a small concise film uh, of uh, maybe about one and a half to two minutes and then uh, mr hebricker will start his talk and post the talk we will have a question and answer and we will also request uh, mr sinemason also to uh, say you know few words from his point of view thank you and okay that's very nice thank you mr peer you have covered the entire gamut of the event today uh, very uh, very crisply uh, uh, pail are you there can you say hello if you are not there we will bring you in later uh you will be here uh, she is not there she is yet to join but she is trying oh. to join she just messaged me so wonderful yeah. wonderful also tapasya i have requested sidesh to see that he offers both the mic and video access to uh, mr srinivas of pcb please uh, uh, enable that process for him right uh, i uh, i will leave it to you and uh, sidesh uh, well, thank you mr very much again and before i get to uh, uh, asking uh, suresh to come on uh, to the platform i will first want to thank tapasya das the architect shilpa ashoka prayojana academy all core committee members who made this event happen the entire set of uh, creative visuals for not only this event uh, there you are pail uh, i just got started with one sentence and uh, well you have come in now uh, uh, what i'll do is i'll break uh, i'll break uh, here uh, Pai Jain, can I request you to speak for a minute or two, or whatever you think is appropriate uh, for this occasion, which is the first of a series of twelve, as you know? I'd like you to speak for a couple of minutes. Pai Jain, I've had a little bit of a challenge uh, joining in. Uh, very right. sir, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon, Pai. Good afternoon, Pai. 
thank you. Uh, I uh, just want to say thank you to everybody for starting off this Hare Bharat Mahotsav in such a fabulous manner. Um, thank you very much, uh, Suresh, for being uh, a panelist, for inspiring our uh, audience today. I'm really, very really grateful. Uh, this year, we have, because we are all in the virtual space, if we weren't anticipating the kind of interest we would get. So, as you know, uh, Dr. We have grown last year from 50 events. This year, we are hitting almost 100 events across the country uh, related to sustainability and primarily reaching out to an audience of uh, students. Uh, I'm just very grateful to be a part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And having me. Welcome. <laughs> Great. Um, anything else you want to add, Pyle? You will talk about the trust. It's not for me to work. Maybe you can talk. You know more than I do, so I won't take uh, the time of the sure. audience. I'm happy sure. to be here. Thank you. All right. Uh, um, well, as I was saying, I must thank all these wonderful people at the Court Committee of the ITBC Bangalore Chapter for making this happen. The idea was begun about 30 days ago. One day, Mr. Bailey said, this is not on. We need to do an event. We need to try and see how we get something that is physical. We initially thought of doing it at the National Gallery of Modern Art, but then we realized that the auditoriums are all not uh, available and uh, any such physical gathering is uh, not going to be possible. About 10 days ago, I requested Suresh Hevlikar, a dear friend for some years, and a man who is a distinguished film actor, filmmaker, environmentalist, many caps that he does. And uh, he instantly agreed and said, and then we said to ourselves, we will see how this becomes, therefore, the first of this monthly distinguished lecture series, which will be uh, a, a sort of a collaborative uh, 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 initiative from the Prem Jain Memorial Trust and, of course, the Indian Green Building Council of the CIA. Um, well, this is the first, as I said, we have 11 more cities and 11 more months to go. On the 28th, which is the uh, penultimate day of this Harit Prem Bharat Mahotsav, we are having the Prem Jain Memorial Address. We have had it for two years now, 2019, 2020, and 2021 now. And we have three very, very distinguished speakers there. And uh, those of you who are interested, maybe you can put it up in the chat box and uh, Siddhesh and others in the IGBC will ensure that you get an invite for that memorial address, uh, which happens on the 28th. And uh, Pyle, is that at 5 p.m. on 28th um, or earlier? The memorial address, Pyle? It's at 2 p.m., Doctor. It's 2 p.m., 2 p.m. That's right, 2 to 4.30. And that's right. it's, a, it's a very wonderful event. There is a 3D kind of an auditorium uh, sort of simulated uh, model there, and you will all enjoy it. Uh, uh, the Memorial Trust itself was born in less than 60 days of the demise of Dr. Payne Jane on the 20th. I mean, I wouldn't say he really died because, you know, he chose maybe 48, 50, 60 hours before his passing away to consciously liberate his soul from his body like a good chain, uh, going back to those timeless traditions of the community that he belonged to. Now, not that he was a religious person, he was a very secular person in many ways. And I have, like Mr. Berry said, many of us, many hundreds of us have been inspired by his uh, utter simplicity and the very, uh, uh, very uh, simple ways of scaling uh, impact, which has been troubling many of us. For instance, Suresh Hablikar, I think, founded his uh, uh, Eco Watch sometime in 2004, 16 years ago. And he has had the challenge, just as I have had with the Altec Foundation was also started in 2004, of scaling impact. The issue, therefore, that, you know, in very, very remarkable ways that, that Dr. Jane uh, addressed was to utilize the resources of the CIA and of the Indian Green Building Council, which was established in 2004, to bring impact of, that was staggering. You know, at one point in time, we had only 20,000 square feet, as many of you members of the IGBC here will know, but I'm actually talking to some of you who are uh, initiates and new to this uh, forum. From there, we have now taken it to something like seven, how much is that? 75, 7,000, 750 crore square feet, if I want to talk in square feet, or 7,500 million square feet. Now, these numbers are not easy to achieve. When he passed away around the end of 2018, that figure was at about 6,500 or 6,000 uh, um, million square feet or 6 billion square feet. We have come a long way. 
Suresh Hevika. We invited him primarily for he brings a refreshing sense of candor and, uh, and, 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 and earnest to his overview on sustainability. I mean, many of you here have listened to experts in the building industry. But here is a man who isn't an expert in that sense from the building sector. He's an, I, I don't know if I can call him an environmentalist or an ecologist or an ecological activist or whatever. He has planted many, many million trees in North Karnataka and in many other parts of Karnataka in the last 15, 16 years. He has gently, quietly persuaded, never carried his clout as a celebrity, you know, into uh, some, uh, shall we say, corridors or soft corridors of the government and ensured that there was enough support to bring such reforestation and afforestation in part. So he's not actually only been speaking about it. He's also done what he can to, to sort of breathe life into those visions of his. He studied, uh, you know, uh, at the Dharwad University in, uh, in Hubli Dharwad. He comes from those parts, from a very distinguished family, by the way. And then he does his post-graduation in uh, uh, Malnad, which is the lab of the, of the uh, Western Ghats itself in some ways. And so his, his love for the Western Ghats from his childhood into those years, formative years of his uh, education, grew very strongly. Now, whether you talk sustainability, environment, ecology, or what humans can do to protect these, there are very many different perspectives, and we will listen to him soon. From the time he was a film star, in the 1978, 1979, 80. I remember seeing that Mani Ratnam film of his, Pallavi and Anu Pallavi, I think it was called, uh, Suresh will know, uh, back then in the early 80s or something. Uh, we will put out a little, uh, whatever, film of 60 seconds for you all to know. Uh, you know, and uh, younger uh, Suresh, shall we say. Uh, I, that, you know, he, there are other aspects of, uh, of uh, Suresh's work from those years. There was one song, a very celebrated song, which is shot around a lake. Uh, to the south of Bangalore. That lake disappeared in some four or five years after the shooting or some such thing. Suresh will tell you the story much better than I know. I mean, these are little stories that I have uh, got from him over those uh, times that I have met him. Last year, I was with him over a quiet lunch in a restaurant. And, you know, in his very animated, very energetic ways, and, you know, he can put, uh, he can put a 20-year-old to shame with the kind of energy he brings. He was talking about this new project that he has in mind of making a series for maybe National Geographic or for Discovery on these larger aspects of the planet. And as a filmmaker, his handle on the medium is so powerful that I don't doubt at all his capability to make a series that could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, gaining global acclaim if only somebody uh, supports and brings, uh, makes him a producer. Um, well, he's worked with Mani Ratnam, as I said, he's worked with P. Lankesh, he's worked with that other distinguished filmmaker, Girish Kasravali, many others. Remember that he was a thinking actor and not just the masala box office film star. He's made many films on the environment himself. He spoke to me pro pre-COVID, as I said, about, about this ambitious series of documentaries that he wants to make on the world's ecology. He's full of ideas and speaks with an enthusiasm that will that will shame any one of us who are, you know, I, I, I wanting to see uh, that we push those frontiers of sustainability. I have one regret that I carry, Suresh, that I could not give you uh, the home that I that you kept asking in one of those projects of mine. I know you love those homes, uh, deep eco homes and such. Someday I'll probably make it when I make some project of that kind. But I've decided I've done enough with projects and homes and such things. I will only want to see if I can work on accelerating sustainability. To all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to me, India being a sustainability guru for long centuries is borne out by one very stark impression that we all carry every time the Kumbh Mela happens in Prayag or in Nasik or in Pushkar. Remember, today's theme is India has forever been a sustainability guru. I suggested this to uh, first to Mr. Berry, then to uh, Suresh Shadlikar. They both instantly agreed. Remember also the idea of the phrase sustainability guru is something that Dr. Prenjain used to be very fond of. Uh, he always believed, like many of us do, that India has led uh, and has been the capital of such spiritual supports and pursuits uh, in many, many multiple ways. Millions who go to those Kumbh Melas stay for days on end on the banks of the holy rivers or the Kunds, for instance, in Pushkar. Pushkar. 
How do they do that? Nobody advertises for a Kumbh Mela. They spend their own money. Most travel with their own food in little cloth bundles. I've seen them eating like that with, uh, with either rice or dry roti. Sometimes it is bajra with pickles. Rarely do they buy anything in the markets around the river bank or the, or the Kund itself. I spent probably five to six days in Ujjain once when the Kumbh Mela was happening. I went for not because I was a Hindu. I went there because of the sheer spirit and the spectacle of such things that that uh, India has celebrated. I don't Hindu is a short, is a word that is only two hundred years old. 18, 18 or eighteen nineteen. Richard Burton, the archaeologist, uh, actually first devised uh, this word called Hindu. We were never called Hindus before that. If 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 India today has the lowest per capita water or energy consumption at some 1,100 units per day, it is because of these millions, muted millions of sustainability gurus who do it not for want of money, but because it is a way of life that they have inherited from their forefathers and they have bequeathed to their children. In the cities, we occupy only not more than 2% of the land mass at 140,000 square kilometers. We are, well, about 55% of the people, depending upon who is talking about that figure. And what do we do? We claim just 10 to 12, 15 percent of us claim about 80 percent of India's natural resources. Is this the way we want to go ahead? Do we want to learn from these sustainability gurus, 700 million of them, 70 crore people who teach us how to be sustainable? I will stop there. I will now leave the floor to Suresh Heblikar, the filmmaker, the environmental champion for his distinguished lecture, which is the first as Mr. Berry said also, of the monthly series from the Prem Jain Memorial Trust in collaboration with the Indian Green Building Council. The Bangalore chapter has, as always, the privilege this time of initiating this pioneering direction on the Distinguished Lecture Series. I must say as a Bangalore chapter member that every single pioneering initiative from 2008 when this chapter was born, by the way, we were the first chapter to be born in India for the IGBC. We have been pioneering many such initiatives. We will hear Suresh Habikar share with us his thoughts, insights, perspectives. Over to you, Suresh. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right. Thank you, Hari. It was a wonderful talk. When, uh, in your talk, you said how millions of people go to Kumbh Mela and they eat not just because of what they are given, but by way of tradition, by way of what we call in India, Sampradaya which is the most important word for life, culture, and society, and how they eat little food, and they can, without being hungry, they can sustain their lives for millions of years that had been going on in this country. So today we look at a world where people are talking about sustainability in terms of society, in terms of economics, in terms of culture, but less in terms of environment. This is where I just wanted to butt in and say that it is the basis of environment, basis of environment on which is, on which our human society is based. Our cultures emanate from the kind of environment that we have. Now, if you look at Punjab, if you look at Kerala, if you look at Karnataka, if you look at Tamil Nadu and so many other states, where there is a distinctly different kind of food and clothing and even the kind of architecture, because we have different atmospheres. In Kerala, if they eat, if they if they eat more of uh, you know fish or uh, coconut and a boiled rice, it is because that is a place where that kind of atmosphere, the temperatures prevail, and they compel human beings to eat that. Similarly, if you come to Karnataka, North Karnataka, we eat jawar, we eat bangan, we eat more of chilies and more of uh, onion. It is because that. Because, because North Karnataka is a place where the temperatures play an important role. We have what is called an ecotone belt in Karnataka, especially in North Karnataka. That is the place uh, which starts from the cross from one Haria Tungabhadra and ends up to the Malaprabha River in Belgam district. Malaprabha, which takes its origin in the Kumbh, in uh, Kunakumbi in Khanapur, which is surrounded by very thick enormous evergreen and uh, sub-evergreen forests of the Western Ghat biodiversity hotspot. It is these between these two rivers is about 200 kilometers and about 45 to 50 kilometers width 
you find about four ecosystems which nestle with each other, which merge into each other. That's why it, be, it came to be called as Ecotone Belt. But unfortunately, not many environmentalists, nor the forest department is aware of this kind of an Ecotone Belt which exists in India. Nowhere else in India, nowhere else in the world, except in Canada, where the prairies meet the forest, you will find this kind of a land which is so fertile, which is so celebrious, which is so nutritious in terms of having soil, humidity, relative humidity, air, and the kind of water and the lakes that we have. Dharwar had about 1,000 lakes earlier. And these, you know, you have heard of Dharwar Peda, the Babu Singh Peda. I asked once the Babu Singh's son and his grandson, I said, why people come and stand in queue and buy, and they bring the cars and stand in queue to buy your Peda? He said, sir, here the cows drink water from the lakes and eat grass. So the milk that we get from the cows has a swada, a kind of an aroma, which I tapped and started making the Dharwar Peda. What I'm trying to say here, trying to stress upon is the kind of ecosystems, four ecosystems. We have the Western Ghat forest, we have the bushy forest that is called the scrub jungle, and then as it subsides, we have the lake ecosystems, and as the lake ecosystems subside, we have the grasslands, the Deccan Plateau. So these four ecosystems which prevail in the North Karnataka region have given array of array of vegetables, fruits, like in I, if I say like Jammu, the king of fruits. We have the guava, we have the mangoes, we have kauli hanno, we have parge hanno, we have bori hanno. You name any fruit that is available in the entire country is found here. Unfortunately, the environmental considerations, which must be very comprehensive and holistic, were not taken into consideration by the government. And this, they launched about 15, 18 years ago, a big industrial area called the Belur Industrial Area. It is an absolutely a wrong location for the industrial belt. I spoke about it after this launch this, because that particular area is meant for agriculture, horticulture and animal husbandry. Because we have creeks, we have grasslands, we have beautiful, uh, nutritious soil, which is meant to produce millets, which is meant to produce guavas, which is meant to produce mangoes. And that could have glorious, I mean, tremendous amount of these vegetables and fruits could have been produced, which would have been suffice for the entire state. But unfortunately, you know, we put a lot of 2,000 acres of land were occupied by the government and then many of them have been taken over by, unfortunately, a lot of politicians, which they have not started industries. But those who started industries, many of them closed down. Because there is something going wrong here. Because when we want to talk about sustainability, there is a sustainability, Guru sustainability, which Hari wanted me to speak about. See, here, we did not take into consideration the basic requirements of industry whether industry or any kind of an economic enterprise has to be based on environmental consideration, like soil, minerals, water. Hello? Okay. Am I being interrupted? No, okay. So we have to look at, we have to look at labor, we have to look at land, we have to look at the other materials, the raw materials which come from the natural resources. The natural resources constitute the environment. There's a big talk going about in the world. We started talking about the, the electric, the, the battery cars, the electricity battery, whatever, the battery cars, the Tesla and all that. But we are forgetting how the car is produced. You need the iron, you need aluminium, you need plastic, you need uh, manganese, you need so many other minerals. You have to produce anyway. Only thing is we are not going to use fossil fuel like uh, the diesel or the petrol. Maybe it is a battery which is going to pollute more and which is going to be extraordinarily expensive. Whether the people would be able to buy it is a thing. And then the rest of the production of the car itself is going to put a lot of stress on environmental resources. So we have to consider this. So there are four elements like human, social, cultural and environment when we talk about sustainability. Now, the everything I would like to bring it to environment because 
particular environmental assets. You no, know, we we drew our culture. We drew our society. Siddesh and sorry, Siddesh and all the rest of you, please mute because you know we are hearing you and is interrupting Mr. Hedlika. Sorry, Suresh, apologies. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So we have to think comprehensively and holistically about environment. It is a matter. It is matter. It is water. It is marsh. It is anything. So these are the, so I was talking about the ecotone belt of the North Karnataka region, which made that place very, very prosperous. When we talk about prosperity, again, which is very ritualistically, routinely used in the Indian expression that become prosperous. This prosperity itself is going to bring down the environment. Let me tell you that, because when we talk about prosperity, we, we have in our mind clearly the materialistic civilization. Prosperity comes from buildings, from cars, from money, from gold. Well, all these things are needed. We have to understand there is a very sensitive line between is between need and want. The industries have created a tremendous amount of wants, but we have to consider whether we need them. If only thing, if you, know, you go on considering, you go on using the products which only you need, then perhaps there is going to be a certain amount of balance between ecology and economics. Because this ecology and economics are very important subjects to consider. Because when we talk about civilization, when we talk about economy, when we talk about prosperity, when we talk about jobs, we always hold in the back of our mind this economy means industries, industries means material civilization. It is a culture. Mr. Hari spoke about how this, uh, you know, the Kumbha Mela, millions of people go there, they eat little bits of roti, little bits of whatever is available by way of tradition, which they have been doing it for thousands of years. And that has sustained their lives. We have to understand this because nothing sustains. You know, in our mind, what we have been talking about sustainability is that, uh, you know, whether the cars that are produced, the telephones that are produced, the buildings that are produced, so many other products, the tangible ones, are they going to remain? Are they going to be relatively available for the whole humanity? We have to think about it. Because right from the civilization, which started, you know, thousands of years ago, that people were moving, food hunters and gatherers, when they shifted from one place to another, slash and burn, you know, started happening. And they came back to a place where they had found out the same kind of uh, agricultural prosperity or agricultural, you know, residues which were available for them to survive. That means it was the surplus economy which made them settle at a particular place. It's a surplus economy. Although I am saying that economy need not be considered, but humanity as such, because for human mind, what is important is this desire and then security, then legacy which you start which you all want children, your grandchildren have to survive. That's why you build a house. You have to have wealth to keep it in the bank or earlier we used to keep money elsewhere, wealth and gold and all we used to keep in, in, the, in the hidden places. But today it was not there because saving today is investment. Saving today is income. That's why we save it in the bank and then the bank gives you whatever interest and all that. So now anyway, so I have to think about how the Indian economy if we are thinking about sustainability, apart from what you spoke about the Kumbha Mela or so many other traditions which have been going on in India for a long time, we have, the, for instance, there are millions of people who follow certain spiritual life. They spend their time in the forest. Well, I remember meeting a young Swami of just 18 or 19 year old boy who came from Himalayas when I was just about 14 or 15 year old boy in Dharwar. He came in search of my father. My father had passed away at that time. And then he stayed in a house for a couple of weeks. He used to eat the grass seeds. He took me around. Our house was surrounded by beautiful mango garden, by beautiful guava tree, by drumsticks, and then a lot of grassland. And he picked up the grass seeds and he brought, he powdered it, he added a little jaggery, 
and he made small, you know, round like balls of this. And he would eat about four or five in the morning, four or five in the afternoon, a couple of two or three in the night. And my mother said, Oh, fellow, you know, he's only eating grassy. How can he survive? Ask him to have little rice and dal and all that. After 50, he said, you know, we are used to going into the forest and we can't think of breakfast and lunch and dinner because when we are, when we fall deep into meditation, we begin to think about many things. We, our rivers do not really require so much of food as you are used to having breakfast and lunch and, you know, dinners and all that. We don't require that. No, we require the human mind to be completely stable, completely devoid of all these desires. That's why we could think more, we could you know, meditate more, we could uh, philosophize, whatever. So this, you know, right from the beginning, I was thinking of this kind of a spiritual life. Not that we have the spiritual gurus here in India. Many of them, I do not, they appeal to me at all. They don't appeal to me because we have seen the gurus who lived in a very sparse, you know, commodity like, uh, you know, their uh, small chapels and uh, they're uh, just one, you know, piece of cloth around them. And then they have the mat on which they would do yoga in the evening and just sleep with little food. Such this kind of a life which was, you know, oriented, which is an Indian oriented life. That's why I always thought, why in India, millions of these children who studied the Gurukula system, where they would sit under the tree and look at the sky, look at the bend beautiful rivers, and they would go on flowing and they would go on taking their turns. And the kind of a vision which started, you know, sprouting in the human mind, it gave them the uh, idea and the knowledge of mathematics, philosophy, and uh, vision of uh, life of the, uh, the world. It is very important to think because we always think of uh, higher education, management education, so on and so forth. But eventually, we have to think in terms of the local local life, the local available materials, the local available resources upon which your life is based. People are thinking today, like even the United Nations said, that have fair trade policy. Whatever is available in the world, if it is produced well, let it be available very freely or at a lesser price uh, you know, to other countries. But then, you know, we have to think in terms of how it is packaged, how it is shipped, how, you know, so much of uh, uh, you know, the natural resources are spent, like the oil and the gas and all that. So it is eventually, it is a local uh, economy, the local ecology, you know, which is going to support you to survive. So that's what I thought the Western Ghats need to be thought about in, in India, because Western Ghats are not only, you know, the bunch of trees which have made the forest. Western Ghats are a uh, treasure trove of medicine, treasure trove of manganese, treasure trove of uh, steel. I mean, you all miss most of the iron ores that are available. The medicinal plants that you get there, tremendous amount of biodiversity. Think about this nation, think about the whole earth in the entire universe. This planet is the only place where human beings, wildlife, you know, like the elephant, the tigers, the beautiful birds and the butterflies, the beautiful forests, the oceans, the rivers, all these are seen only on this planet. There is no another planet like Earth anywhere in the universe. And we must be really awed. We must be fascinated by these beautiful gifts. Which we, they are divine. And we must think of really sustaining them. And how do you sustain them? Like the Stanford University brought out a wonderful report a few years ago. In that they said it is the economic expansion. It is the industrial expansion. It is urbanization. It is the increase in human population, which are putting tremendous stress and enormous stress, uh, stress on the natural resources of the world. And there is this is where the global deterioration of the environment is being, you know, is being seen. How we, how is the uh, how is the global environmental deterioration taking place? You know, they put a lot of scientists ecologists, the economists, the sociologists, and the physicists, they put them to work. They said, why, in spite of so much of thinking in the world, which is going on about environmental degradation, environmental, you know, equanimity, environmental balance, 
and all that, why there is still so much of environmental degradation going on. So after working for years, they came out, they, they thought that it is a human population, the increased demands of the increased population. Because today, we are aware of the problem. Maybe about 50 or 100 years ago, very few people had the cars, very few people lived in the, you know, the top buildings and all that. But today, everybody needs everything. Today, we need a phone, we need a motorcycle, we need a building, we need, a, you know, city life, the urban life. That is the reason why we say that billions of people in the villages today are not interested in living in the villages because they are influenced by the TV, they are influenced by the telephone, they are influenced by so much of exposure which they are getting day to day in the last 10 to 15 years. And once our governments, unfortunately, in India that I have seen, we have been focusing only on building the great urban cities, the metro cities. The big cities are a big drain on the environmental resources. Because Indian whole tradition, we have to think in terms of how mind has been working in this country. As you know, we have been a traditional people. Look at our way of life, our culture, our food, our clothing, our way of thinking itself. Most of it is based on the, in the tradition. And we have gone against the traditions by building big society, the big, you know, the cities. That's why I always thought even the political elections, like for instance, the, the elections that we have today, they are fought in the small towns and the villages. They take their own people who belong to their caste and religion and community and they get elected. They eventually, when they, they, they form the government, they would like to give jobs to the youngsters who are brought from their community. And whether these engineering or other colleges which are working in the small towns, whether they really deliver enough or, or a good knowledge or not, unfortunately, unfortunately, I, I have to say that, because in the small towns I have seen the colleges and the teachers, some of them are extremely good, but many of them are just formed because of the political influence, political pressure. So such people are taken. They say, please give, my son has done his engineering a job. What kind of a job? What kind of, the private companies cannot take him if he doesn't really, you know, give a smart answer or if he's not very smart in his understanding of the present society. Then he has to go take a job either in the PWD or the BBMP or BWSSB where the political pressure can work. Unfortunately, we have, unfortunately, this kind of people. That's why we see more craters on the road. We see the breaking up of the pipes, breaking up the tanks, breaking up of many of these small, small little bridges and all which happen in the, which are built across the country, in the small towns, in the small villages. We have, unfortunately, these problems which are being piled up every day because of the kind of educational division that we see today. So, to think of this sustainability. Now, let's see. For instance, there are 823 billion rupees. 823 billion rupees were made by 10% of Indians out of the 136 crore people in this in this country. Only 10% own 77% of the national wealth of India. And during the pandemic, during the pandemic, there were about 823 billion rupees made by these rich industrialists in spite of the, uh, the pandemic. Then how, how, when the world was suffering, when India was suffering, when millions of workers were working in, in big cities, they did not get food, they did not get transport, they walked for miles and miles, for hundreds of miles to go back to their home. I wrote an article about it. I said, when they go back, Many of them will not return because it was enough for them to live in a big city where the hospital, for instance, charges were not being met by them. Here, you know, when a, a city like Bangalore, which started chasing wealth because there were more than 500 multinational companies came and established themselves here. And a lot of youngsters, more than 25 to 30 lakh youngsters today are working in these companies. They are given cars, they are, they are given lot of facilities. They even the, for instance, today economy is weak in India. It is not even growing, it is recovering. Even recovering sometimes is not happening. It is because of in 2014, you know, the liquidity prices, the prices of a lot of our commodities was crashing, including the oil. And that was the time 
which across the world, across the globe, we had to recover our economy. That was happening in India. It happened in 2015, 2016. But in 2017, the demonetization took place, which was followed by the GST. And these two things, they hit very hard the small and med medium type enterprises of this country. They are uh, backbone, the medium type and the small businesses of this country. You can just go anywhere. If you think of the vendors and all in the streets and all, that is a fact of the economic life of this country. If there is a black money in Mumbai, which was considered as a financial capital of this India, a lot of black market was going on in India, but the money was not held, held in captivity. The money was in circulation all the time. The money was in circulation. But the government was always thinking that the taxes are not paid. Many people said, why should we pay the taxes? The taxes are paid and the politicians, the bureaucrats are using it for their own, you know, uh, tremendous life. Why should we pay the taxes if it is not going to be put into the developmental schemes, which eventually will benefit every common man of this country? So there have been this kind of uh, economic, social life, which is ripped apart in the last about 15 years in this country could we really be a sustainability guru for the world? Well, in terms of spirituality, in terms of what Mahatma Gandhi said, what uh, you know Einstein said, what uh, Chalakya Kalyanam, this uh, Chanakya uh, Kautilya said, these are all great administrations, no doubt about it. They have said wonderful things because nobody said much about environment as such, because environment is critically a subject which is very, very delicate because we have to use the moment we are born, we start using water, we start using clothes, we start building, you know, a lot of things which are required for human life, for existence. They do, they do make an impact on our environment. So nobody has really tried to say this, but only one thing, our Mahatma Gandhi has been quoted by any of the great uh, ecologists or environmentalists or even the university reports. Stanford University, when they brought out the report, they said how you address eventually the problem. You are talking about global deterioration. Yes, it has happened. But how are we going to address it? Are you going to stop production? Are you going to stop the economic progress that is taking place? The university said there are three people in this world. Toro, Schumacher and Mahatma Gandhi. Sh Schumacher who wrote Small is Beautiful. And that was a fantastic book in 1973, which was brought out by the Oxford University, though he was a German, he studied economics. He said that the small projects, make your projects around the communities, not around corporations. This is, this is what he said. And in big, in big projects, our money is squandered, our resources are squandered, our peace is lost, our intelligence is lost, not in the small projects. You could always handle, you could repair, you could make the projects run. You know, if with this intelligence, with the skills that you have, is available for you. And you can always go on small projects that are more sustainable. Mahatma Gandhi, his life itself was a great example. Because then you know Gandhi who did not, you know, who did not promote big industries, who promoted Khadi. Khadi is a product which empowers millions of women, which helps agriculturists to be well and which is a product where it is not, where not much of chemicals, nor electricity, nor water is used. That's how Khadi is. Today, yes, we need fashionable clothes, designs and all that. Yes, Khadi is made available for these fashionable people. You can even mix a little bit of heroin and make it more stable. You don't have to really worry too much about, oh, Khadi, Khadi's crumpled cloth and so on. Well, our thoughts have to go, our technology has to go. The, another most important thing, which came in 1972, where the MIT students rep were representing their institute in 1972, where the first economic, uh, the environmental conference, the global environmental conference took place. There were certain scientists who perhaps wanted to promote the production and consumption. And these production and consumption patterns of the world today have brought down the environmental uh, uh, environmental, you know, balance or environment, whatever you can call. So these students said that whatever modifications you might think of 
bringing about in the environment and the in the scientific interventions we will be interested in bringing about the scientific interventions with modifications and to help the consumption and production of your economic goods industrial goods whatever but they said that there is a limit to growth nothing can be nothing can be relentlessly produced nothing of these activities economic activities can go on relentlessly you can go on eternally no there is a limit to growth so it is important that 1972 the best students of this mit they said this later about 8 or 10 years ago the stanford university brought this report and then the united nations of course does not have many experts in terms of speaking about environment and how it affects the production and consumption and the life of the people mind that is very important even einstein said about biodiversity he said if you really destroy biodiversity the human population will survive only for few years which is absolutely true it may there may be some uh, you know artificial pollination which may go on so the artificial pollination is also endemic it in the sense it is only confined to a particular society where the particular food is being produced and they will use the artificial uh, pollination it may not be available for the whole world so we have to think in terms of how environment you know was created how beautiful biodiversity has been created how these western ghats the amazon forests and all of but unfortunately these forests are being you know hacked these forests are being encroached the forests are being plundered in the last 50 in the last 100 years for 50% of the forests of the western ghats have been gone we get our rains the western ghats of south india which are considered as the biodiversity hotspot of the united nation we have lost 50% of these forests which has affected our you know rainfall which has affected our water which is nearly in the whole of india 70 major rivers which take their birth in the in the forests of the western ghat they have billions of acres of land are plowed billions of acres of land are irrigated and plowed and watered by these rivers because these rivers take their birth in the forest we have in uttar karnataka area we have four rivers mahadai kali malaprabha and ghataprabha which uh, irrigate millions of acres of land which run hundreds of industries produce thousands of jobs light up millions of homes just imagine because of the forest the forest is at the base of human civilization and human culture forests are not just bunch of trees they give us medicine they give us biodiversity in this wonderful soil they they have protected millions of people who live in the edges of the forest and who live in the deep forest also that is why we have to think how forests are very important these forests were not created by human beings the forest was created you know by this we don't know how but however i would like to say that we have these amazing gifts which the planet has like the oceans and all that but we keep on plundering them the way we like the way we want to that should not happen how to create awareness is the most important thing i have believed that it's the children we have to create awareness among children about the importance of the soil because you don't see any soil in bangalore today unfortunately we have asphalted the entire bangalore we have chopped all the mounds we have leveled all the you know low lying areas and when the rainfall comes where does it percolate where does the water go how do you grow how do you bring up the soil how do you, sorry how do you bring up the grass how do you bring up the croton how do you bring up the flowers how do you bring up the vegetables all these things have to be brought over a distance of kilometers today so the more important thing today if the cities have to survive we have to focus on the peri urban area the peri urban areas are slow in even today are slightly untouched by the government agencies so the peri urban areas are the areas where people are not totally urban or they are generally uh, between but fortunately we have the soil we have the grasslands we have the water bodies like the lakes and the ponds and the wells we have the cattle we have a good air and these are the things where we have to grow our vegetables and crops 
and you know produce a lot of fruits and also a lot of milk unfortunately bangalore which has about 4000 acres of grassland near esergatta i saw that is the paper is precedence has been given to the film city i belong to the film what is what is this film city going to do jumping and dancing and fighting these are the kind of films that we are making and for this you are sacrificing thousands of acres of grassland where about the milk dairy of bangalore produces 80 80 million 80 lakh sorry 80 lakh 85 lakh liters of milk is being distributed every day in bangalore i asked the managing director of bangalore dairy i said where are you going to feed your cattle don't stall feed them see i remember in dharwad we used to go to bombay restaurant that is a place hotel because he used to give us dosa and the gunpowder that is a chutney puri and along with that he used to give a, a spoon or two spoons of beautiful aromatic wonderful uh, sorry uh, this thing uh, ghee and when i went recently he said suresh babu i cannot give you ghee i cannot give you that dosa why baba i have come all the way from bangalore to eat that dosa he said we don't get any kind of that kind of milk at all we have lost the grasslands we have lost the lakes our cow the cows that used to produce this milk and we produce that you know, ghee out of the milk is not available anymore that's what i'm saying sustainability is becoming eventually and gradually a big problem a big issue for anybody i don't think because every human society has evolved in its own way looking at its natural resources looking at its geography its culture it has brought out its own civilization its own culture so it has certain standards it has certain so one need not replicate what is good for another society it because the temperatures the culture and uh, the kind of the social norms they differ from human beings to human beings they differ from society to society but certain things like as you said the yoga like for instance the little food and uh, you know not not compromising with this kind of life that we have lived in our in, in our in our country so these are things which automatically you know will be followed they automatically they will be liked and lived by other people i mean they will be copied by other people to survive in their life for instance we have to retain our environmental resources don't think that you know these environmental resources are going to be rejuvenated we only talk about rejuvenation recycling reduce and all reduce is yes not recycling and redesigning all these require lot of energy although we think of producing by using alternative sources of energy like light and wind and biomass but eventually we will also predict because that will take a lot of time it will take a lot of time until then if we have to retain our environmental resources so that you know we can retain lot of our culture lot of our traditions because we cannot live without a culture i'm i'm sure about that when a culture comes to us the moment we are born the moment you know i mean our, our parents and uh, the heritage uh, comes with us it is not just you know copying or a heritage copying the culture it is there in our genes it is produced there in our mind in our heart in our uh, genes of this so if we have to think of indian traditions indian culture which are much greater and which have created like great systems like for instance the, the kumbh mela and things like this there have been beautiful traditions where for instance the ekadashi that every week one day you would go without food it is good for the human body it is good for your mind and it is good for culture so even uh, our great prime minister one day when he said there was less of agricultural produce you know he said let us go you know riceless and the people believed because he was a very great man lal bahadur shastri we can go without rice let the rice go to the jamans that is why today the farmers protests are going on they say jamans are with us we will continue the protest until the laws are repealed we will not stop this because we have to think how the stop soil which has taken hundreds of millions of years to be produced 6 meters of top soil if the top soil was not there i would be sitting here and talking to you 
there won't be bird there won't be a tree there won't be a grass there won't be any kind of a environment on this earth it is a top soil which has created a wonderful life on this earth which we have to think of you know retaining which we have to think of respecting otherwise if the top soil see that is why the big cities today are suffering we are we don't understand we only think in terms of raising elevators raising the metros raising so many you want to you know just go in a train and look at the kind of the, the mountains that have been chopped because the train requires hundreds of billions of tons of stones which are crushed and which are laid along the railway line where do they get the stone from and they it requires sand which requires mud it requires a lot of stones from the mountains these mountains have been created and they save our topsoil they save our grassland they save our wildlife and they cut the fast growing wind and protect our uh, agricultural fields and horticultural uh, produce so they do not of these things we have gone on perishing them we have gone on chopping them just to make money so this is the this is some university said the chase for affluence we want to become rich fast by making just commissions and things like this okay yes fine but you know if you keep on doing only the kind of work that brings you money then you do not think of environment you do not know how people are surviving it's going to be bad even a country like india as i said where 10% of the people own 77% of the indian wealth which is a bad thing because today people are aware they are critically aware of how they are living they want everything which very few people are enjoying they want those things also today millions of youngsters are migrating from the villages to the big cities because their mindsets are changed they look at they have the mobile phones they look at the tv advertisements the marketing advertisements which ham them ham their minds and they sit there they cut the grass they soil their hands they said we don't want to soil our hands anymore we don't want to go on cutting the grass and feed the feed the cattle even the girls are not ready to marry the boys in the villages because the boy they say no the we the moment we marry the boys in the villages then we'll keep on we will keep on suffering because we are made to go to the well to wash the clothes we are made to go to the lakes to bring water we have to smear the floor with dung where we cannot sleep there are no toilets and the government has not looked at our rural india they have not done much except uh, you know uh, announcing the elections and when the elections come the members are elected they put just some roads that's all maybe electricity has been given but the rest of the things like the economic activity the social activity the cultural activity all these things have to grow simultaneously like it is in the cities with the youngsters today they spend more time on the mobile phones and they are getting influenced recently i was in a village i went to a small shop to buy a thing and then there was an old woman she started shouting a name i asked her who are you shouting for she said i'm calling my son i asked her whether he has a mobile phone he said she said yes for the last one hour he's only looking at his mobile look he's sitting there so he went he was sitting there with his two friends he never bothered to look at his mother never went to the shop she said this is how i am strong enough she said i will continue to serve this i know maintain the shop and serve the audience but uh, unfortunately i don't know what will happen to my children because they are neither going to the school nor are they going to college nor are they working nor are they helping us to do agriculture we don't know what the boys are going to do so this is the kind of village life we have today that's why i said very urban area are to be looked at as the productive centers the ecologically and economically productive center because there we have a lot of environmental assets the ecological wealth like the grasslands and the soil are still available we need to tap them judiciously in such a way a create awareness also we are doing it we are developing some lakes there in the peri urban area we have tried to create awareness among the panchayat members telling them that the big universities of germany india have you know found out that if these things if the very urban economy does not survive then the cities will collapse so let us be 
very clear about building the big cities. We have, we must be aware that Ford in America said more than 100 years ago that nobody need to have a bus, nobody need to go by bus or train. I will give car to everyone. Yes, at that time there were only 10 to 15 crore people. Today there are 30 crore, 300 million, and they have a land which is three times bigger than India. They have more resources. They can still, still America is suffering. America is economically suffering. There are millions of people who have no jobs in America. That's kind of a democracy which is in peril at the moment. Though uh, recently we can see. So nothing survived. The material civilization is unpredictable. We need not depend on that as a surviving, <laughs> surviving mode. Because we, we have to be sure only mind survives, the thought survives. That's why I believe that Shakespeare, it is uh, Gandhi, it is uh, Buddha. It is Vivekananda, it is a great term, it is the Mary Curie. These are the people who have done something which affects our life every day, which affects our behavior, which right. affects our mind. So these are sustainable. What happens, what impresses us will be remain for a long time. Not the car, not the buildings. Okay, yes, some buildings. We keep thinking about some buildings <laughs> like Eiffel Tower. We think about the pyramids of Egypt because they were greater vision. They had a wonderful vision that these will have to be looked at by millions of people around the world and think about. So we have to create such uh, items. We have to create this psychological you know, conditions in the human beings that what we say is right. For instance, we keep on talking about Gandhi. As I said, the Khadi, which there does not use chemicals, does not use electricity, does not use water, and the women keep on yarn you know, taking out the young, they have their economic employment and they also take care of the men because who grow a lot of cotton. So these are the things which we need to look at in terms of sustainability. If sustainability Sorry, can, I, can, I, can I request you for another yes. say, three, four minutes in a way that you uh, wind up by talking about how this, this three millennia of sustainability yeah. uh, that India has practiced could possibly inspire some semblance of the future, modicum of the future. Yeah, I'm sure it will, because the only thing is India, which is in the last 15 years, which has been copying the Western models. I, I, am, I have also read the Western civilization, which is very good. Uh, we have to make one thing which is certain. The Western civilization just did not happen in a you know, short span of time. It has taken more than 150 to 200 years. Yeah. They started manufacturing pin. They started manufacturing. They made pin. They made knife. They made scissors. They made sure. cycle. They made motorcycle. They made car. They made aeroplane. They made you know the space equipment. Right. We did not make any of them. Think about right. it. We are sure. only we brought the car. We brought the computer. We brought motorcycles here and we only are using them. They have encountered a lot of issues, environmental, economic, cultural, in the process of manufacturing them, right? They had to create cities, and the cities in the West were built by the farmers, right? Farmers, and they built big cities, which are going to endure for a long time, because they have, see, for instance, the New York was built with the idea of keeping the city alive for coming hundreds of years. It's, it has taken, it has taken enough measures, architectural and the planning measures, to see that they, encounter, they will in future not encounter any such problems of immigration or human population pressure sure. on the sure. city. So, right. but we have not. We are only using the products which came from there. Okay. So we That's have right. a problem of, we have a problem of you know, throw away. Yeah. We just use and throw. We are creating a lot of waste. We are creating a lot of these okay. things. We want, there is also corruption because of this. The corruption yeah. is also, yeah. because we so, want a car, we want a phone, but we want, we do not want to work hard. We do not, we do not think of the kind of work that was put in by the Western civilization. It was necessary for them, for many of their cold countries. They had to invent, you know, steel, they had to invent, they had to go for mining. Yeah. They had to manufacture many products to survive. And not that they use, you know, the cars and things like that, the way we think they do. They don't. They walk. 
you know many of the countries in Sweden, Denmark and all that, they use cycles, about 70%. Can I, can I, can I, can I what I'm you? saying is, yeah. there, there are many countries which sustain you know, themselves by using the kind of resources yeah. in such a way that they will sustain their lives for a long time. India, India will also, if we, if we do not think in terms of building the cities, if we look at our the rest of the, as in the rest of the society, like the small villages, the small towns, where, as you said, the traditionally people have been used to a certain way of eating, living, you know, drinking water, whatever it is. If that is a kind of a life, if we want to focus with certain technology, of course, mind sure. such a thing, it cannot stop suddenly. Sure. We have to use technology, but in such a way that these things are not going to be a big drain on our environment. Right. And we live a much better life. I get that. Please, if that can be done, then I'm sure that sure. India can be a sustainable guru. You know, sure. for the There's sure. no doubt about that. We have taught yoga. Yoga is being practiced everywhere. So it is a wonderful thing. People are fasting also many times. And a lot, lot of, lot of uh, foreigners we have met, they love India because there is so much of culture, food and all that. Yeah? Right. So we have to look how they like, why they like it. You know, these are the things which need to be scientifically looked at. And uh, if you want to create a India, which can be a sustainable guru for the whole world. I got that. Thank you. Mr. Mary, your take. You have to unmute yourself. Who, me? Not you, uh, Mr. Uh, Said Biri. Any quick take, Mr. Said Biri? No, we can't hear you. You have to unmute. We cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now it is. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Suresh uh, Hedrickers. It is an amazing journey you have taken all of us. Uh, so far, I thought you are only a filmmaker and ecologist and environmentalist. You are also an economist. You know, you are also a development commissioner. You know, you should become. You should have become the head of the our five years. Uh, you know, planning commission. You know, because overall, what I what I noticed, uh, Suresh Saab, is uh, your your uh, you know the sensitiveness. You know, and your uh, the compassion. You know, everything. Uh, you know, mold into a compassion and a more of an empathy and uh, taking everyone together. You know, that is something uh, really, really great. I feel for whatever you have said, you know, the uh, the, the India's ethos, you know, our, our uh, culture, our diversity, our unity in diversity, it is all something, you know, we can give it to the whole world. Yeah, but yeah. what is happening because of these, uh, you know, somewhere in between the greed and pride has taken over all the other, you know, sane element. You know, for everything yeah, and anything, you know, we go yeah. with that. In the bargain, yeah. in the bargain, whether it is sustainability, whether it is, uh, I mean, you know, when we when you develop the project, we cut the tree like as if we have some vengeance with that. Yeah, we don't yeah, even yeah, cut; yeah. we chop it. You know, Absolutely. so so that kind of a mindset. We need to come out, but that very, very difficult. You know, it is uh, easier said than done, sir. You know, because uh, the mindset today is all of a averageness, a mass thing, you know, and it is all me, my, and myself. You know, there is no key factor. You know, forgetting sure. that, sure. everything was going to sharing. You know, yeah. so you are talking of the, the containment, you know, it's not a recent memory. You know, the yeah. containment will come by sharing. Not by amassing, you know, so right. that Absolutely has to come right. from both ways, you know, sure. from top down and bottom up. And unfortunate factor of uh, you know, is the, 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 the gurus and, uh, you know, these mullahs and the, the religious heads who are supposed to teach us, you know, um, unfortunate, very, very unfortunate. I'm not saying all, exception is always exception, but generally, most of the people, they're also in the same rut, you know, right. they're also in their own self-centered uh, kind of a thing. So sharing has taken a backseat, you know, many small thing like, you know, how to become a minimalistic, you know, minimalistic approach. Right. You know, yeah, whatever right. is that. Second is containment. And I feel that is a key, sir. Until, yeah. until we have that self-containment and then we must take inclusiveness. 
and my inclusion is it is not only the people the people the flora and fauna the animals the environment everything is included and right. that and that's only india can do it provided we do it in that uh, clear concept unfortunately we don't see that now let us pray to god and uh, but i i, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, your uh, talk uh, um, abiko uh, honestly you know uh, may your tribe uh, increase and uh, god bless yeah mr very i just yeah. mr very i wanted to tell you one thing that i'm i'm really impressed uh, by your uh, you know by your attempt to start this series of lectures right. and uh, and especially as you said uh, dr jain yes who thought of the green buildings because the sure. green buildings are really sustainable there is no doubt about that sure. even the even whatever repairs and you know renovations that you would like to do to the green building it can be done as you said in a minimalistic way for instance the kind of the structures that we see along the coast in the south india okay. there is more than about 2000 uh, miles from goa to uh, you will see that the kind of structures which have been created have been sustained there for hundreds of years i agree with you yeah, hundreds of years they have not used the steel and uh, there are many things which i wanted to quote but you know for want of time time so, i agree. for instance I, so i just want to say one thing yeah bam, bamboo is a thing which we have to look at because in certain kinds bamboo there is agartala especially agartala bamboo if you twist it and put it under pressure it becomes like a wonderful wood like a steel it yeah. also anti the tensile thing yeah yeah right. so if you look at this in the green building concept if you introduce the element of bamboo it will go a long way in sustaining these buildings that's very good. Well, we, are, we, are, we are doing that i will uh, there is another gentleman here in the group uh, i don't yeah. know if he's got uh, mic access a man called deran there is another man called santi kate we are doing some good work great, great. Wonderful, wonderful wonderful things will happen but you have a question uh, suresh from a person called raghava yeah he says about the great values of the yesterday years which contributed to sustainability uh, somebody has to mute there is some noise that is shall i mute not you somebody else who's got some scratching yeah, noise that's no i was getting it through all time yeah yeah i i i uh, don't know it's coming from uh, getting a little <laughs> so I, I, i don't know where it's coming from it i thought I first it was mine anyway he says as you mentioned to you sir he's saying yeah, yeah, as yeah. you mentioned most of us have forgotten those traditional values where do you think he's asking you where do you think it's the whole line how where do you force Where do you think is the line? Huh. How do you foresee the scenario on sustainability? How do you see the uh, scenario on the scenario of uh, sustainability? Yeah, yes, sustainability. you see, yeah. anything that happens happens for some time because human mind and human our societies are such that anything new that comes that will fascinate us for some time. Yes, yes. but we get we. we get fascinated you know with many of the new aspects with many of the new facets of our technological or whatever life but we get, we soon get fed up with those things also yeah, eventually we eventually will fall back on the pattern of life that yeah. has been laid you know for us for hundreds of years so sure. the world also will think in the same thing i met one american long back he had come to address the wildlife conference he spoke about his grandfather who used to take him in an old ford car and he would stop at some places wherever and uh, this young boy said why don't know why my grandfather is stopping at some places only there is grass i told him this grass he says this grass is so beautiful yeah. this grass brings lot of moths yeah lot of butterfly yeah. And, yeah. and he said he started remembering all that when he was addressing the wildlife right he said i my my grandfather was so good my yeah. grandfather had learned so much this exactly what thoreau sure the american who wrote who, who who wrote a golden book golden pond golden which pond, is considered yeah. the bible on environment although yeah. he did not although he didn't study or speak about it. see when he when he, he went to the city after living in the city he got fed up went to a small town built his own small two bedroom house and yeah. lived there for rest of his life he's a lot cabin yeah a lot too exactly 
Right. You know, he, he, he spent his own money to publish a book. Correct. He purchased and it. He, uh, 18 years later, after he dies, yeah. that, book, that book became a stop. A kind of a hit. Amazing. Many more people bought. Because, you know, he began to yeah. cultivate fruits and vegetables in just two acres. He That's said, true. there was so much enough. I don't yeah. know why I spent all my life in the city, he said. Yeah. And when he was walking about 1,000 yeah. kilometers, sure. many people asked him, why are you walking, sir? Why don't you take a car? If I walk, if I didn't walk, how do I look at the moss and the grass, you know? And how do I look at the soil that brings yeah. so much of pleasure into my life and sustains you know, my walking? To, to all of you there, uh, let me tell so you. This is what, no, short, this is, uh, this is answer. answer. So no, I'm saying to Mr. Agarwal. I agree with you. I know when you talked about grasslands, I say so many times now. To all of you, I must say, take a short ride to Hiriur. Turn right. Yeah. That road yeah, comes to Bellari. Right. Go about 50 or 60 kilometers. You will find a small town called Chalakere. Park yeah. your car. Walk mm -hmm. from there in the grasslands. There is about 15,000 mm -hmm. hectares. That's what? 1,500 yeah. square kilometers of, uh, hectare, of uh, grasslands yeah. there. If you look at your uh, Karataka map, you will find this large, uh, whatever, a green body there, uh, like the grassland. Yeah. As, as a matter of fact, when you look at Sharavati or the Badra sanctuary, you will see large water bodies on the Karataka map. Right. You will find a grassland map. Please walk there. I did once, uh, Suresh, about eight yeah. days, we walked in the grasslands. Nothing there. Absolutely mm -hmm. not a single tree in that Chalakere grassland. Yeah. Yeah. What a phenomenon, naturally yeah. speaking. Absolutely. So I must and say that, have... you know, we have the small animals, like for instance, we have the wool, we have the, uh, you know, we have the, what is that beautiful bird? We have uh, the beautiful big bird. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the, the grassland bird called the Indian butterfly. Yeah. Indian, uh, in fact, Indian, uh, there is Rajpal here. Uh, uh, you know, Rajpal also is a uh, friendly artist. He's from the Nickel the, the deer herds. Yeah, 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 sure. The deer herds and all that. They are yeah. all confined. They all belong to this grassland, you know. They are Absolutely. beautiful family. And okay. the grassland is extremely good for, you know, saving the water. Ground oh, water. yes. Oh, yes. Ground you must take to Grassland Conservation at EcoWatch and we will see what we can do to support you. Sure, sure. I we will make, uh, uh, if, if I may, I will make only two, three small notes. Look at this. Yeah. Look at this wonderful tour he has taken us from 1860 and David Toro to Aldo Leopold to Patrick Getz, 1915 to 1925 and urban planning and then of course to jc kumarappa he didn't mention kumarappa but he talked about gandhi and the you know uh, cooperatives and so on alvin Toffler, 1970 the future shock schumacher 1973 yeah. russell carson he, he forgot to mention carson i know he's one of those great fans of her book 1964 all hack hawk in 1994 and yeah. between all these people in about 130 years they have told us how much and so you know that uh, that we can do we are right. not listening Rajpal Navankar is just now telling me that we, you all must look at dcf.org.in. I'll introduce you to him, Suresh, one day. Sure, sure, this sure. man, he's about 62 or 63. He will mm. he will talk more than most of us will do. But he's mm. so full of commitment and energy. He's traveling all the time. He's just now, you mentioned Kanapur. He said yeah. he just now come back uh, from there and he is planning some mining rejuvenation effort out there. He can't mm -hmm. speak, but he's on the chat box just now talking to all of us. Okay. Here is this wonderful tour that he's offered us at this distinguished lecture series. Very appropriate for the first one. Chase for affluence. Topsoil is the only asset of the nation. Redesigning also costs a lot of energy. I will ask you which hotel that is in Dosa and I will have been in Nizargata and go and eat that <laughs> Dosa probably. Bombay, Bombay that, restaurant. Bombay okay. restaurant in uh, Subhash uh, Road. Okay. Of Harvard. Of yeah. Harvard. Okay. Amazing hotel. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And of course, you know, and look at the connection he made. Cows in Hesargata, cows in Dharwad and Beda. Yeah, yeah. What an amazing, you know, uh, he did not give you a lecture. I think he gave us a set. What happened? Sir, I think uh, I think we have lost the connection of uh, Dr. Hariharan. Dr. Hariharan? Yes, yes. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, you know, shall we ask uh, Mr. Srinivas to speak for, you know, two, three minutes? 
Mr. Srinivas, are you there, sir? One second, sir. Let me check if he's there. Okay. No, sir. I think he has left. But Hari has come. Hari has come. Mr. Hariyaran? Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Mr. Hariyaran. Hari? Sorry, I lost you there. Yeah, you can continue, sir. I'm Mr. so Hariyaran, sorry. You can continue. I'm no so problem. sorry. So, uh, you know, just to say that that kind of a tour de force that Suresh Hemlikar offered us today is something that I have had the privilege of once in a while listening and, uh, you know, sort of uh, getting from him. You know, he talked about the Belur industrial area and he talked about, he didn't talk about today the Birdi industrial area, you know, which is also another story. I think to me, the fact that he could talk about these things in these little stories and homilies, instead of giving us a formal lecture, made all the difference. Even if we are a small crowd, look, at, I, I know that Mr. Berry listened to it, fascinated. Uh, Suresh, let me also uh, assure you that uh, this conversation will be is recorded and will be made into smaller kind of uh, short, uh, uh, you know, uh, grand, uh, movies like short films like right. and yeah. it will be aired on social media it will, it will make it as interesting uh, last uh, concluding notes from uh, uh, mr Sakhiri. well <laughs> thank you once again uh, mr suresh Blicker and uh, yeah. all our co committee member every one of you you know whenever you whenever we come with some program some thought process you know the kind of help and support what you give it to us is something really amazing. You know, in a short time, we managed to get this such a wonderful uh, lecture on our, you know, great uh, uh, patriarch, Dr. Prem C. Jain memory. And uh, so thank you, uh, everybody, for that. Thank you, uh, all the audience and the participants. Yeah. Thank you also due to the uh, IGBC CII Secretariat and more particularly to Mr. Siddesh Kumar uh, and uh, Haryan Sam. You know, thank you, a special thank you to you because you got uh, Mr. Uh, Suresh uh, Hablikar. And uh, honestly, as you mentioned, it was not a lecture series. It was like a professor talking to the students. You know, it is something like a opening your heart. You know, there is so much to carry for us. Thank you, Mr. Suresh. Thank, thank you so you, much. Sir. Thank you. God thank you. God thank you. I just and want to thank you, uh, Barry Saab and Mr. Hariharan, Dr. Hariharan, Payal, Sitesh and uh, uh, the other person who sir, 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 before yeah. before you before you conclude you and hari both spoke about the green grass yeah come to our village sir my sure. birthplace is uh, mudigere chikmanglo but oh, i raised wonderful. in a place called i raised in a place called kodi kundapur which is a very uh -huh. small you know tiny hamlet it is mm -hmm. uh, you know 30 kilometer north of uh, manipal facing okay. yeah. abc i will definitely so whenever I go Whenever yeah. I go after the morning prayer, I go on the barefoot walk on the beach. Oh, Believe me, yeah. one walk of nine kilometer takes yeah. me takes my entire health care for one month. <laughs> it's an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling. Wonderful. So whenever Wonderful. you are in that part of the you know uh, Karnataka, please do let us know. We will walk yeah. together hand in hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of you, particularly to Tapasya, Shilpa, and others, Ashok, of course, for making this event happen. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Tapasya. Yeah. Thank you, Tapasya and Siddesh. Thank you. Sir. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.